on any of the quizzes or anything, but I think Calc to this one textbooks do an absolutely terrible, I mean Calc to this two textbooks do an absolutely terrible job of providing any kind of real motivation for these geometric sections. So I'd like to start by asking if we can find any application of this material outside of a calculus textbook. And, I mean, I sort of touched on this um, towards the end of the semester in Math 151, but of course that was a long time ago. Um, that the main difference, or the main application of area between curves is if you have two curves, and you want to measure how far away they are from each other. So, can we give an example using that idea? Let's take a side step into the world of economics and see how the area between curves is used in a definition in economics. In particular, how it's used to define what's called the Gini Index. So before the Gini Index, <coughs> We define the Lorenz curve. And the Lorenz curve is a good example of the type of function that shows up in the real world in the sense that you're not going to be able to write a form to the down for the Lorenz curves. But I should say the Lorenz curve or the Lorenz function of a country, first of all. Each country has its own Lorenz function. And in this function, x represents the poorest x proportion of a country's population. So for example, x equals 0 0.2 would be the poorest 20% of the country's population. And L of X is the proportion of the country's wealth that poorest group <coughs> controls. So as an example, which I'm sure is completely out of date by now, but well, let me let people finish writing first. As an example, which as I say, I'm sure is out of date by now, because this was about 
a decade ago. But you heard a lot, or maybe you still hear a lot, about the one percent. In America, 2020, I'm sorry, 2012, L of 0.99 equals 0.66. And what this means is that the poorest 99% controls 66% of the country's wealth, whereas the richest one percent, even though they are only one percent of the population, controls a full thirty-three percent of the country's wealth. So the Lorenz curve, or the Lorenz function, I should say, is measuring income inequality, basically. Income equality will occur if L of X equals X. The poorest 1% controls 1% 1 of the wealth. The poorest 2% controls 2% of the wealth, and so on. So we have this situation X is a fraction, it's a proportion, it's between 0 and 1. Y is also a proportion. So if it's a proportion, it's between 0 and 1. Yeah, this is kind of, kind of crowded together. Let me copy that up there and then erase this. <clears throat> I didn't stop doing it in calculus one, and now I'm still in calculus two, accidentally erasing stuff. So x is between 0 and 1, L of x is between 0 and 1. Income equality is represented by a straight line. And now you have this function L of x. So, I mean, I guess everyone's politics are different. I would say that you want that function to be close to the straight line. I am a fan of income inequality. No, I'm not. That's the opposite of what I wanted to say. I am a fan of income equality. So you can, in that context, you can ask yourself, how far is a country from income equality? And the idea is, okay, we have a curve that represents income equality. We have a curve that represents how incomes actually work. 
if we want to measure how far these curves are from each other, one way to do that would be to physically measure the area between these curves. And that is basically the Gini index. I say basically, the Gini index is defined to be a twice the area between L of X and Y equals X. Why twice? You haven't missed anything here. It's just like, you know, if you look at video game reviews or whatever, and they're always a scale on a scale between 1 to 10. I mean, why 1 to 10? Why not 1 to 7 or 1 to 15? And there's no real answer. It's just convention. Um, the area between these curves is always between zero and one half. Taking twice the area between the curves makes it be between zero and one. And just by convention, people decided they preferred that. So, in calculus terms, the Gini index is twice the integral from 0 to 1 of x minus L of x dx. And you can define Gini indexes. Calculus this is a lot more uh, powerful, and integration is a lot more powerful than I think these textbooks tend to get across, because these textbooks are all, well, here are these integration techniques, but they're hard and they don't always work. Whereas in the real world, if you want to find the area between a curve, you can just numerically estimate it to however many decimal places you want. So in practice, finding integrals is never a real issue um, for people who need to in the real world. Um, just if anyone is curious about how we stack up, in terms of income equality, the answer is that we could be better, we could be worse. As of the last time I checked, the Gini Index of America is about 0 0.411. That puts us comfortably better than some countries, for example, the Gini index of Brazil is 0.539. It puts us comfortably worse than other countries. The Gini index of Finland is about 0 0.274. <coughs> Don't memorize those. They're just, since we talked about it for 15 minutes, I thought we should probably give some of them. And now that we've seen some application of this, back to the material in the textbook. 
So we've actually come quite close to finishing area between curves. There's just one uh, sort of thing that remains to be talked about. So we've looked at the area between curves where we have an upper curve and we have a lower curve. We've looked at the situation where we um, have curves that look like this. We have looked at the situation where our curves are enclosing an area and look like that. But in either case, there's an upper curve, there's a lower curve, and if we're on an interval from A to B, the area between these curves is the integral from A to B of the upper curve minus the lower curve dx. The topic we still would like to talk about <clears throat> is what if we have curves that are vertically oriented? What if we have a curve like that and a curve like that? And we want the area between those curves. Um, it turns out that that this is done in a very similar way. Instead of an upper curve and a lower curve, we now have a left curve and a right curve. And Instead of having a left and a right bound for those limits of integration, we now have this lower bound and this upper bound. Well, the integral is still, I mean, the area is still the integral across these bounds. Now, instead of upper and lower, we have right and left, and instead of dx, we have dy. Let's investigate all of this. Let's especially take a look at that dy. So the easiest way to have this situation is if you're in a, if you're something like this. Find the area between x equals y squared minus 1 and x equals the cosine of y. So the easiest way to have a left and a right bound are to reverse the rules that x and y usually play in an equation. And our calculator is helpless to graph these. <clears throat> Think after 
However many decades it's been, they could, but, um, but Desmos is not helpless. You can type x equals y squared minus 1, and, let's see, x equals the cosine of y, and Desmos will show you these curves. I am sharing this, right? Yeah, Desmos will show you these curves, and you see this cosine and this y squared minus 1 are enclosing a region. Let me see if I can shade it for you. y squared minus 1 is less than x is less than the cosine of y. So it makes perfect sense to ask about the area of this region. And with the form to the, it's basically plug and play. We'll take the right-hand curve, we'll subtract the left-hand curve, and then we'll integrate. The right-hand curve is the cosine, <clears throat> the left-hand curve is the quadratic. And when we write this down, the cosine of y minus y squared minus 1. Well, our variable is y now. <coughs> which is why we have dy instead of dx. It's just telling us that we have a different variable. I haven't written on the board those limits of integration. Let's go back to Desmos. And C. So we're now sort of going vertically from the bottom of the screen to the top of the screen. This region going vertically begins here and ends here. <clears throat> And now you have to be a little careful. Um, our variable is y. Um, so this point and this point, it's got an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. And because our variable is y, it's the y-coordinates that we need here. Negative 1.177 and positive 1. <clears throat> <coughs> Any questions so far? Then let me simplify this a little. This negative sign is going to distribute, so we're going to have minus y squared plus 1. And now the fact that our variable is y instead of x changes exactly nothing about the integration. 
So the antiderivative of the cosine is the sine, the antiderivative of y squared is one third y cubed, the antiderivative of one, well our variable is y now, so the antiderivative of one is y, and we are integrating across these limits of integration. <clears throat> And let me, we can go ahead and go to our calculator and do this. Let me quickly chop this into my notebook so that I'm not constantly having to remind myself of what this function is. And we have, really, I feel like entering, entering these uh, differences into our calculator remains my least favorite part of calculus. It's just so tedious to do, but minus one third of that cubed plus that <coughs> minus, and now we repeat this with a negative sign, 1.177 minus one-third, we've got this negative quantity cubed. Let's try not to make any mistakes. We've got this negative quantity cubed and then we've got plus negative 1.177. And there is our answer after a lot of, a lot of keystrokes, 3.114. Any questions about this problem or about this process? You really, for the most part, you really do need something like Desmos to do this, just because, as I say, our calculator where are the equations? They're here. Our calculator is not going to, to let you enter that into it. So just as far as like determining which is the left and which is the right function by graphing them, and then as far as finding the limits of integration, I don't know how you do that on the TI-84, which is also why since I see two people with computers, I won't ask you to do an example of this in the class because most of you would not be able to. But let me end with an example. 
Let's find the area between some curves. Y equals 2 divided by x. Y equals 1 half x. And y equals 2. So I'm giving you three curves instead of two here, but once we, once we graph these curves, um, we'll see what's up. Y equals two divided by X. Y equals one half X. Y equals two. You see if these curves are in trapping a region here. So it makes perfect sense to ask the area between these curves. Now our variable here, I mean, this is written in the way the problems we did yesterday are written. Um, but this is still a situation where it might make more sense to think of having a left and a right function function than it does to think of having an upper and a lower function. Because what happens as far as these upper and lower functions go? Let's just sort of move left to right. Here, this line, y equals 2, is the upper function. This curve, 2 over x, is the lower function. 2 is the upper function. 2 over x is the lower function. And then suddenly that changes. 2 over x is the upper function. 1 half x is the lower function. So your upper and your lower function change. And we talked about this at the end of class yesterday. It's okay if your upper and lower functions change. But it does mean that we're going to have two different variables. Let me set this up for you. Initially, our upper function is 2. And our lower function is 2 over x. <clears throat> and what are our limits of integration here? Well, this region starts at 1, and the point, let me put this into Desmos for you, maybe make that dotted line or something. This is where the upper and lower function change. To the left of this dotted line, 2 is upper, 2 over x is lower. To the right of this dotted line, 2 is upper, um, 1 half x is lower. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to find this area, and then we're going to have to find this area. So this area, our limits of integration are from 1 to 2. Is this, I, I suddenly, I'm listening to myself talking very fast. Is this making sense to everyone? 
because to use this formula, though, we need to have a fixed upper function and a fixed lower function. If our upper and lower functions change, we have to break the problem into pieces. We have a piece where this is our upper function and this is our lower function. And then we have a different piece where this is our upper function and this is our lower function. Having Having two different pieces gives us two integrals. There's the area of the first piece. In the second piece, our upper function is still two, but our lower function has changed. And I think that upper bound, I don't remember it actually, the upper, um, the right hand bound is four. So none of this is the end of the world. <clears throat> I mean, we can find both of these definite integrals. Um, the antiderivative of 2 over x is, the na is 2 times the natural <coughs> log of x. That's probably the hardest part of this. At the same time, I mean, you are computing two different integrals here, and you're computing two different antiderivatives, and that's certainly a certain amount of work. If instead of upper and lower function, you thought of this in terms of a left-hand curve and a right-hand curve, well, suddenly this problem goes away. This line is always the right-hand boundary of this region. This curve is always <coughs> the left-hand boundary of this region. So you can get away with a single integral, right? Just the right minus the left. Having said that, there's still a price to be paid. If we want to use the right and the left instead of the upper and the lower, we save work in most ways, but there are some additional steps. Let me just roughly sketch this region. So this is y equals 2 over x. This is y equals one half x, and then that upper boundary is two. The price you have to pay if you want to use this formula. <clears throat> I won't erase anything, I'll just circle it. The price you have to pay if you want to use this formula is this dy. To use this formula, our variable needs to be y, not x. So, 
you would be making an error if you wrote this is the integral of the right minus the left because we need to integrate with respect to y. Our variable here needs to be y. So how could you get around this? Well, the price you have to pay for having a single integral is doing a little algebra. If y equals one half x, that curve is the same as x equals to y. And y equals two divided by x if we solve, this is the same as x equals 2 divided by y. So that right-hand curve, instead of y equals 1 over x, 1 over 2 times x, we write it as 2y. And likewise, that left-hand curve, that equation has to be rewritten so that our variable is y instead of x. I mean, I would still say that this is the easiest way to approach this problem. I mean, it took me much less time to solve for x and to solve for x and get a single variable. This is no longer an error, so let me erase that. That took me much less time then it would have taken me to approach two different integrals. So there is a cost, but I think using the right and the left curves here makes sense. Finishing this problem out, our variable is y now. So in terms of our limits of integration, we need to know what y is doing. Well, this region starts <coughs> here at y equals 1, and it ends here at y equals was two. So our limits of integration are one and two. And since we have six minutes, I mean really more than six minutes, but <laughs> Six minutes to bring us to the standard class time. We might as well finish this problem out. The antiderivative of 2y is y squared. The antiderivative of 2 over y is 2 times the natural <coughs> logarithm. Um, the absolute values aren't actually going to <coughs> do anything here because everything is positive. But um, it's always a good habit to put those in. So let me see, it was 2 squared 
minus two times the natural logarithm of two. Yeah, we're plugging in this limit of integration. Two squared minus two times the natural log. And again, the absolute value of positive two is still positive two. So it's not like, it's not like I'm forgetting the absolute value here. It's just that the absolute value of a positive number doesn't change it. And then one squared is one, of course, but I'll still enter this into the calculator. The natural <coughs> log of one is zero, but that's not something you have to have memorized. We can just plug it in. And we get the area between these curves as a single integral, 1.614. And that takes us to the end of this section. I'll post it out get the due dates on the calendar, and I'll also post an announcement reminding students that we do have quizzes for this first week, and I will see you on uh, Monday. So, um, Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. You are correct. Uh, Monday is Martin Luther King Day. I will see you Tuesday.